month, NASM is giving you free courses. That's right, free courses each month just for being part of the NASM family. Learn about everything ranging from nutrition to strength, weight loss to stress relief, and everything in between. Click the link in the bio for information and to claim your free course before they're gone. You are listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hello and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie and today we're picking up where we left off. We have been barreling through basically the testing domains for the CPT7. So if you're studying for the Certified Personal Trainer uh, seventh edition that NASM is going through right now, if you are studying for this, we over the past several weeks have been doing a highlight reel, kind of a study guide, a real high level study guide for that content. Now, if you're already NASM certified, I think these are great reminders of the information that you've studied. So let's get into talking about what we're going to talk about today. So we've covered the first four domains, the testing domains that you're going to be going through. So this is domain number five. It's the fifth domain. We have one more domain after this, and this one's going to be broken up into two different podcasts. And the fifth domain is covering chapters 13 through 20. So chapters 13 through 20, these are exercise technique and training instructions. And 24% of your examination is going to be taken from this content. 24%. That's more than any other domain that we have gone through and individual domains. So we're going to talk about exercise technique and training instruction starting in chapter 13. So let's go ahead and talk about what we're going to be talking about. First of all, let's get into really one of the centerpieces of NASM, which is integrated training principles. And integrated training is very important for us at NASM because if I'm working, let's let's just say with athletes, I'm working with athletes, then it's very important that as I work with an athletic population that I am not... Uh, only focused on one thing, that I am integrating different concepts into that training protocol. And integrated training is a concept that combines all forms of exercise into one system. So here we're talking about flexibility, cardiorespiratory, core, balance, plyometrics, speed, agility, and quickness, resistance training, all of these being put into a training system. And it's also important to note that the integrated training principles are systematically implemented through NASM. And NASM will do something um, that, that many other focuses should be, which is a progressive overload. So it is a progressive system. And thinking about a system itself, which means we kind of have a good idea of where a person starts and where we plan on taking them. Now, their goals are important. But we have a system in place that says, well, if this is where you are physically, then here's a system that helps us to deliver you to your goals. And we have an entire system, the NASM OPT model, that says this is where the goals primarily are. So it might be strength or hypertrophy. It might be power. And I have a map that can put you in through those goals. But the integrated system, putting all the types of exercise within each major category. So I know it's not just resistance training. It's not just cardio. It's not just flexibility training, but there's so many other things that we're going to implement and that's integrated training principles. Now there are fundamental movement patterns and some of the fundamental movement patterns are going to be, we'll break them down into five major uh, patterns right here. So the first one, we'll talk about squatting. So there's a squatting pattern there's a hip hinge pattern and a hip hinge pattern would be think about like a Romanian deadlift or think about a kettlebell swing. That is a hinging pattern. There are pulling motions and pushing motions. So squatting, hip hinge, pulling, pushing, and then vertical pressing. 
would be another example of fundamental movement patterns. Now, it's interesting because you could kind of break a lot of these down into pushing and pulling patterns, and it just depends on what area of your body is doing it and what plane of motion you're in. So the planes of motion make it very um, uh, relevant when we look at change and how we're going to get people to push and pull in different ways. Now, let's talk about something we call the acute variables. And it doesn't mean that they are precious or darling. Acute means that it is something that is short term. So the variables means that these are the things that we change acute short term. So what are the short term variables of training? Well, it could be repetitions, could be the sets. So repetitions is the number of sequential um, exercises that you do. So like a push up, how many repetitions you might do 20 push ups. All right, well, we might do one set of that. So your sets are acute variable. And as you get stronger, as you get more stable, then you might add more sets to that. Your training intensity. So the intensity, you adding more weight, working a little bit faster, trying to increase the amount of METs that you're doing. But that intensity, how hard you're working is an acute variable. Another example of acute variables would be rest intervals. So after you're done with your set, how long is your rest before you go into the next set? If it's a circuit, then it might be very limited. And at the end of the circuit, you might say, okay, well now let me take a minute or two of break at the end to build up my rest. So there are different ways to program rest intervals. And then your training volume. And your training volume, there are two different ways to look at it. There's sets times reps. So your overall training vo volume. And then there's your load volume. So that means that you can add the amount of weight that you lifted into your sets and into your reps as well. So there are some examples of acute training variables right there. Well, what else is going on? Let's talk about more of this integrated training concept. We look at flexibility training as a, a centerpiece for somebody's integrated training. So let's go flexibility training, and that could include several things. We'll get into it a little bit more, but things like self-myofascial techniques and stretching. There's cardiorespiratory training. Well, there are many different types of cardiorespiratory training, just like there are different types of flexibility training. So when is a good time to implement certain types of cardiorespiratory training or certain types of flexibility training? Core, balance training. So reactive or plyometric training, speed, agility, and quickness training, and then resistance training. All of these can fit into a single workout. So if you've got an hour with a client, that could fit in there. Or it can be broken up and divvied out along um, different types of training protocols. So you might have a day where you don't implement your plyometric or speed, agility, and quickness because you want to focus on that on maybe a different day. You might have clients where those two things don't apply at all, that you don't feel comfortable that this is the right exercise for them. So everything's individualized. You have to individualize your programs, but having a system to follow for the general population is, is highly indicated. And it's a great system to follow. It makes it relatively easy. Now it's um, it doesn't mean that you can look at the OPT model and you've got it all figured out. Don't think that, that there, there are challenges to it because there's thickness within this concept, but it is an excellent training model to follow. And once you get used to it, your programming just comes quickly. You should feel a lot more comfortable with your programming and how you work with clients and how you're developing those, uh, macro cycles and mesocycles, micro cycles for your clients. So let's look at the OPT model. Some of the things we like about the OPT model is one is that it's proven and it's an easy to use system of periodization. It gives you a step-by-step -step and a play-by-play -play of how to get people to their goals. And if you look at the phases in the model, the phases are basically saying, if this is your goal, this is what you do to get there. And these are the steps that you take. So if your goal is stabilization, or endurance and endurance, then phase one, stabilization endurance training, is telling you that's the outcome and that's where your focus should be. And you can move through the model in that way, right? So this model is also used to create programs for clients with various goals. 
Now, you might not have an athlete client that you're working with, but it doesn't mean that they don't want to get maximally stronger. It doesn't mean that they may not ever want to move towards the power. In fact, you can have people that aren't athletes but are very interested in kind of the concepts of fitness and still want to be able to do the fitness-based training the way athletes would do it, but for no other reason than just for better fitness. So based on their goals, what do you want out of it? It just gives people an opportunity to follow a model and to implement different types of exercise so that they can go through periodization and then maybe focus on what they want to do most. Well, what do most people want to do? Most people, the common goals are to reduce body fat. Might be, might be the number one goal that we get from people that sign up for personal training. The other is to increase lean body mass. So people want to build some muscle. They want to get stronger and they want to build some more muscle. And then maybe also you would look at they want to enhance general sports performance as the topping out our three most common goals. So reducing body fat, increasing lean body mass, and enhancing general sports performance. Well, let's look at this. We have the OPT model that's going to take us through different levels of muscular adaptation. There's number one, that first step in the OPT model is the stabilization level. Stabilization, why do we do that? to prepare the body for the demands of higher levels of training. There are two major adaptions, adaptations that are gonna be here, improving movement patterns and enhancing stabilization. So we want people to move better. We want them to learn how to move. And it's this is a good place to do it because we're doing it with a little bit lighter weight and doing it at a slower tempo so we can focus on technique a little bit more. And then while we're moving slower and while we're lifting a little bit lighter weight, but for more repetitions, we're enhancing our joint stabilization and the endurance that these muscles have to contend with in order to stabilize those joints. And then the next level in the OPT model, moving from stabilization level into the strength level. Strength, well, that's the emphasis of the strength level, but we also wanna maintain some stabilization and endurance and increase overall muscular strength. So we are building on to our stabilization. We're building strength onto our stabilization. And then we can look at the power level, the next level, the three levels in the OPT model, stabilization, strength, and power. That third level, power level. Power is the emphasis on this level. Our goal is to maintain stabilization and endurance and to increase our overall muscular strength. But then we can start focusing on how fast we move things as well and that is power. And all of it occurs in a progressive sequence. So stabilization before strength, strength before power. And that's how we will focus it, and that's how we will direct it. Uh, let's, let's go through these phases one by one. Let's start with phase one of the OPT model, stabilization endurance. In stabilization endurance, we're gonna teach optimal movement patterns. Let's figure out how to move. This goes into our exercise technique, what is it that you want these exercises to look like? We are going to teach that proper form, looking at the five kinetic chain checkpoints, maintaining alignment, creating optimal levels of joint and core stabilization and postural control. That is another goal of ours. We need joint stabilization, core stabilization, postural control, maintaining that while going through these dynamic movements of exercise. And we also want to prepare the body for the demands of higher levels of training that eventually they're going to be moving towards as they progress through the OPT model. All right, let's look at phase two. Phase two of the OPT model, strength endurance. We want to enhance stabilization endurance while increasing prime mover strength. So here's what you're going to do in strength endurance. You're going to do a superset. The first exercise would be a traditional strength training exercise followed immediately in a superset. So right into the other one, a second exercise, similar exercise, but its focus is stabilization. So let's do an example here. Body part, we're gonna focus on chest. So a strength focused exercise might be a bench press. So we'll do a bench press and then we're gonna superset it immediately with a stabilization-focused exercise, which might be a push-up. 
All right, so we go bench press, and then we run out of gas, and we're looking at our topping out our repetitions without any rest, zero break, just transition time, moving right into the push-up. Well, another example, let's look at back. If we're doing a back exercise, we might do a seated cable row. And that seated cable row might superset with a standing cable row because one is strength focused, but when you stand, now all of a sudden you have to focus a lot more on your stabilization. So we're shifting focus from strength to stabilization, but you're doing both and you're working first your primary movers in the first exercise. You're trying to elicit primary mover strength and then it's immediately followed with an exercise that challenges stability and postural control. And it produces an increase in muscular endurance, joint stability, and helps to um, support your posture while you're at that as well. All right, uh, that was phase two. Let's move to phase three, muscular development. Muscular development, building muscle. This is uh, hypertrophy is a word that we use very often within the industry. Increasing the size of skeletal muscle, What's our goal in muscular development phase, phase three? Well, it tells you what it is in the title, but let's talk about it a little bit more. The focus is on maximal muscle growth. Focus in muscular development is maximal muscle growth. Uh, increase our volume. So we're gonna get lots of sets. The intensity is gonna go up to a moderate to heavy uh, intensity and you are increasing your uh, sets. So even though your rep range might lower in muscular development, your set range might increase, your weight will increase, so your load and volume will increase overall in muscular development. All right, this phase, let's be honest, this phase is optimal because not everybody wants to get bigger. And so you might hear people say, I, I don't wanna get too big. And they're quick to jump into the, I don't wanna get too big. And I, I will tell you that I've been training people for about 20 years and at no point did we do a workout and the next day somebody calls me up and be like, oh, Rick, you did it. You made me too big. I woke up this morning and I am huge. It's embarrassing to get out of bed. I don't know what to do about this. It doesn't happen. I don't know if you know this, but building muscle is not easy. <laughs> it is very challenging. And if you feel it sneaking up on you, get out of this particular phase. All right, good. Let's move on to phase four, max strength, maximal strength. The focus of maximal strength is on maximal prime mover strength. It's about lifting heavy loads. Common for strength athletes, you're going to see power lifters, strongmen, shot putters, America football, American football linemen. Maximal strength training is highly indicated for these individuals. And I think it's also good because it is preparatory. It's a nice preparatory phase as we start to look at what phase five looks like in our power phase. So this predominantly, we're trying to work our primary movers and make them stronger and this can elicit hypertrophy. It can help to develop muscle, but really the, we're gonna see a lot more muscle recruitment. And if you've heard of the all or none principle of mus muscle recruitment, which says if a muscle contracts, it contracts 100%, but that fiber, we're talking about a single fiber, not the entire muscle. Like, so we're not talking about the entire quadriceps group, which means that there are a lot of muscle fibers in the quadriceps, that are relatively dormant. They don't participate in activity. So lifting maximally helps to create that communication between the nervous system and those muscles. And it basically slaps them around and says, wake up, it is time to join the rest of us and help us pick things up. So max strength training, creating that cellular adaptation, recruiting more muscle fibers, focus on maximal strength production. Phase five in the power phase, phase five, power phase, increase our goal, our purpose to increase maximal strength. So we're gonna lift heavy things and to increase the rate of force production, how fast we produce force. So we're gonna improve velocity of movement and athleticism. How? 
How are we going to do that? Well, when we move from one level to the next level in the OPT model, we experience a superset. So phase five, we just moved out of strength into the power level, and this is going to be a power superset. So your first exercise is a traditional strength training exercise with a very heavy load, one to five repetitions, and we're going to superset that with a second exercise, and its focus is rate of force production, how fast we can move it. All right, so let's uh, we did chest and back for the last one, so let's do chest and back for, for this as well. Uh, for a body part being chest, we could stay with bench press as a traditional strength-focused exercise, doing a heavy lift, and then as soon as we're done, the only break is the transition from the bench, standing up, grabbing the medicine ball, and doing an explosive medicine ball chest pass. So we're trying to move as quickly as we can. This is a, a concept called post-activation potentiation. So what you're doing with that heavy lift is you are activating a lot of muscle fibers. And then post-activation, our goal is to now lift something that's very light, very fast, and we increase the potential of speed at which we can move that. So we could also do a back exercise, like a lat pull down. And a lat pull down, strength focused, so as heavy as you can lift, so we're looking at one to five repetitions, and then you can go into a medicine ball soccer throw. And we're not going till the end, you can't throw this ball anymore. We're not trying to exhaust you. We are trying to move that med ball as fast as possible. So that's why you don't see, it's a lightweight, but you don't see 30 repetitions. You don't see 60 seconds of us doing it. For athletic performance, what you do is if you work into and through exhaustion, then you minimize how much you learn to teach your body to move faster. So the goal of this isn't metabolic conditioning. The goal of this is to be able to produce velocity of movement to increase your athleticism. That's power phase five. All right, very good. Let's move on to chapter 14, flexibility training concepts. Chapter 14, flexibility training concepts. What is flexibility? Well, flexibility is the normal extensibility of soft tissue allowing for full range of motion. Factors that can influence flexibility are gonna be things like genetics, myofascial tissue elasticity, your, uh, your joint structure, your age, your sex, previous injuries, your activity level. All of those are going to affect your flexibility, your ability for your tissues to extend allowing for this full or optimal range of motion. So the human movement system, let's just review this for a moment. The kinetic chain, which is made up of muscular, skeletal, and nervous systems. And if one or more of these systems or segments are not functioning properly, dysfunctions can develop. And it's referred to as postural distortion patterns. So you might see things like uh, uh, a forward head position or uh, an imbalance, and that imbalance, let's say that you have one side of your back tighter than the other side, and that can create a shift and cause poor posture to take place. And that poor posture then starts to alter movement, and so now your movement is not as optimized, and then some of these things can eventually lead to injury. And so we are not here fear-mongering injury at all, but we are certainly looking at this saying, well, if I want to, first of all, ensure quality movement. I want to ensure that I'm helping people develop optimal performance, but I also want to minimize the chance that people are going to move into dysfunctional patterns because of me, as a coach, I didn't pay attention to those things. And as a movement professional, that's something we need to pay attention to, movement. So we'll look at this, this kinetic chain and the five kinetic chain checkpoints and understand how the muscular, skeletal, and nervous system work together in the kinetic chain. So there are muscle imbalances that can occur. And alterations in length of muscle surrounding a joint is what we'll look at when it comes to muscle imbalances. And muscles are either overactive or they're underactive. So for instance, if you've got... Um, Let's say that there, it's like a door in a, in a doorway, right? And that doorway doesn't swing just 90 degrees. It can go 180. So you can open a door and walk in one way 
or you can open the door and walk in the other way. So it doesn't, it's not just limited at that hinge, it swings 180 degrees. Well, if that the anchor is off in that, or the system that tries to keep the door lined up with the wall, it starts to shift. And that means that there's something off with the system that's pulling it one direction. So one side's pulling it too much, the other side's not pulling it enough to create it and allow it to even out. Well, if that's happening, then one side's overactive, the other side is underactive. And what we wanna do, and that's a simplification because, but remember this, these imbalances are muscular, they are skeletal, and they are nervous system. So you say, well, what if it's a nervous system imbalance? Well, it's a nervous system imbalance that's imbalancing what? The muscular system and the skeletal system. So if it's a muscular imbalance, then that will then say, well, it's a muscular imbalance, but that affects the skeletal system and it in turn affects the nervous system and how we recruit in our recruitment patterns. So we want to look at that and try to help support people in balancing those out. Muscle imbalances could be things like reciprocal inhibition, where the agonist is signaled to contract and the antagonist is inhibited. Think about reciprocal inhibition, like a bicep curl. If I do a bicep curl, then preferably my tricep relaxes a little bit so my bicep can curl. That, that is reciprocal inhibition. Altered reciprocal inhibition, the overactive agonist, right? is decreasing the neural drive to its functional antagonist. And we see that a lot. We talk about it a lot with things like the hip flexors, where the hip flexors might lead us to an anterior pelvic tip tilt. The hip flexors are short, tight, overactive, and the primary hip extensor would then be underactive, which would be the gluteus maximus. So if I have overactive hip flexors, then my glutes could be underactive, Create, and that creates this altered reciprocal inhibition. That can then lead to synergistic dominance. So synergistic dominance where my glutes are no longer really participating as much as they should in hip extension, which is the primary mover. So the secondary movers, the synergists start to take over, like the hamstrings maybe, and the posterior fibers of the adductor magnus. The synergists take over function for an inhibited or weak primary mover. So synergistic dominance, synergists take over the function of an inhibited or weak primary mover. And that example would be, again, like the glutes being underactive, being the primary mover in hip extension. So the synergists, the hamstrings start to take over and say, let me take, let me get it. Posterior fibers of the adductor magnus go, nah, 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 we got it. Which is tricky, right? Because the more that the hamstrings and the posterior fiber of the adductor magnus start to say, I've got hip extension, then what are the glutes gonna do? The glutes go, oh, okay, go ahead. And then it backs off more. And the more it backs off, the more the glam hamstrings and Addy, Addy Max has to take it over. And the more they take over, maybe the more the glutes start to relax. So synergistic dominance can build really into this incredible cycle of dysfunction. Let's talk about overactive and underactive muscle. Overactive muscle is a muscle that's held in a chronic state of contraction, and an underactive muscle is a muscle experiencing neural inhibition and limited recruitment. Now, that doesn't mean that the overactive one is always short, but it can be. The underactive ones are not always in a lengthened position, but they can be, they, they commonly are. But I wanna think about this, overactive muscles muscles that are held in a chronic state of contraction might be the hamstrings in an anterior pelvic tilt that we talked about. The glutes aren't firing, the overactive hip flexors causing reciprocal inhibition to the glutes, the glutes aren't firing, ideally the hamstrings take over, so the hamstrings are in a lengthened position in an anterior pelvic tilt, but, but they keep contraction in a lengthened position. So there are different concepts that go through it. So just because something is short, does it, or overactive doesn't mean it's short, but it, it is a common dysfunction that takes place. All right, let's talk about some scientific rationale for flexibility training. First thing we're gonna look at is something called pattern overload. Pattern overload, where dif dysfunctions caused by repeating the same movement over a long period of time, just repeating things over and over again. And that repetitive pattern overload 
can uh, gives us good rationale for flexibility training. But there's also something called the cumulative injury cycle. And cumulative injury cycle says that dysfunctions can lead to injury if left unchecked. So cumulative injury cycle starts where you've got um, tissue trauma. And that tissue trauma, when the tissue uh, trauma happens, there's inflammation that takes place. Inflammation can lead to muscle spasms and the tightening and the hypertonicity of those muscles. Then that can lead to some adhesions. And the adhesions can alter the neuromuscular control of that muscle. And that altered neuromuscular control can lead to imbalance. And the muscular imbalance can then lead to tissue trauma. So we've got that cycle of tissue trauma, inflammation, muscle spasms, adhesion, this altered muscular control muscle imbalances, tissue trauma again. So that is the cumulative injury cycle. And it's just the dysfunctions that can potentially lead to injury if it's left unchecked. All right, let's talk about some things, some strategies, some techniques when it comes to flexibility training. First one we look at is called self-myofascial techniques. Self-myofascial techniques are used for treating and breaking up adhesions of the fascia and the muscle tissue. Not only that, it is used to inhibit neural activation in that muscle, causing the muscle to calm down. So we have a neurological decrease by applying pressure through self-myofascial techniques. Self-myofascial techniques can take place with a foam roller. Uh, with a, I mean, there's so many things that you use th these days. There are companies that, that produce foam rollers and funny shaped rollers and balls and, and different size balls. Some of them vibrate, some of them uh, are squishy, some of them are very dense and uh, hard. All of these are designed to apply pressure to the myofascia, muscle and fascial systems, and to to uh, to help minimize some hypertonicity and overactivity in those muscles. Static stretching. Static stretching is what we usually think of, what, usually when we think about stretching, which is taking a muscle to its kind of first point of real tension, not to the point of pain. I think that that's also one of the reasons people don't like stretching, static stretching, is because they feel like it should hurt. And the truth of the matter is it should not hurt um, but you go to a point of a mild stretch and you passively take it to that muscle to the point of tension and you hold the stretch. Usually we'll see that we hold that for about 30 seconds. We hold it for 30 seconds. It helps to create something called autogenic inhibition. Autogenic inhibition, which are the receptors within the same muscles that you're working on, causing the muscles to relax or to calm down. Great, so that is static stretching. Remember the process of passively taking a muscle to the point of tension and holding that stretch usually for about 30 seconds and then it can relax. And if it does, you wanna get further into that range of motion, you can just stretch it again, move a little bit farther into it. There's something called active stretching. And active stretching is common in the strength training phase of the OPT model. So we have three levels in that strength training phase. So active stretching is actually quite good to do during that phase. And it's a type of stretching that uses agonist and synergist to dynamically move the joint into a range of motion. So what you might have is somebody doing a kneeling or a standing hip flexor stretch, and they're trying to stretch their hip flexors but the goal isn't to be like, what's the greatest stretch that I can get for the hip flexors? The goal is let me use my glutes to contract and move me through a range of motion so that my muscles are now used to taking me to and through that end range of motion. And if I can do that as a form of flexibility training, then I'm creating this reciprocal inhibition. So my glutes call, causing my hip flexors to calm down, but I'm also practicing a strength training warm up for my glutes, which is why it is a good protocol leading into some of the strength training activities or the strength training warm ups. It's a nice warm up to add on top of it. That is active stretching. Then there's dynamic stretching. Dynamic stretching is a type of stretching that uses the force production of a muscle and the body's momentum 
to take the joint through a full available range of motion. So that might be, you may see people where they put their arms out in front of them and they kick their, their feet up to their hands. That's a dynamic stretch. They're using their muscles and momentum to help it get to that range of motion. So there's a part of dynamic stretching that includes that. I might lift dynamically my knee to my chest and then hug it to my chest and as I walk. And that is a type of dynamic flexibility, a dynamic stretch. And there are a lot of additional ideas and concepts that go into it, but that's just a brief overview of dynamic stretching that we will focus in on our CPT7. All right, very good. So I think that's good. We've gone through chapters 13 and 14. So we went through some integrated training and we went through some flexibility training. I think now maybe we will focus on, uh, actually let's let's do one more. Let's go into our cardio and then we'll wrap it up for, the, for this particular episode. Cardio respiratory fitness training. Cardio respiratory fitness, it reflects the ability of the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system to supply oxygen rich blood to the skeletal muscles during sustained physical activity. Now this falls under the principle of specificity. And so there are different types of cardio respiratory fitness that can be done. And the principle of specificity is going to dictate what your adaptations look like. So if you're trying to run faster, but you're running really long runs, then you're not getting better at running faster. So just like in resistance training, principle of specificity falls under here as well. Common error in cardiorespiratory fitness training is the failure to consider the rate of progression, right? The process and speed and frequency, intensity, time and type, they're all increased, but oftentimes that's not a focus in cardiorespiratory training because people think, well, let's just uh, go for a run and get on the treadmill or get on the elliptical or get on a bike. And, and this isn't really trained for many people uh, with these same variables and the same focus of programming. And, uh, and, and if you're just doing cardio for enjoyment and regular fitness and maintenance, but you're not looking to progress your cardiorespiratory fitness, that's fine. But if you're looking to get better and progress cardio, your cardiorespiratory fitness and get better at a certain type of cardiorespiratory fitness, then it's vital that you learn more about training this particular protocol with your clients. Well, we're also going to look at the FIT VP principle. FIT VP, FIT, F I T T E dash VP. What does that stand for? Well, F is for frequency, how often. Intensity, the I for intensity, that's VO2 max, maximum heart rate, heart rate reserve, metabolic equivalent training, RPE, so rate of perceived exertion, using the talk test that all allows us to measure intensity. Time, how long are you going to do this? So you're gonna do this maybe frequency, three days a week. All right, well, for how long? What's the intensity for how long? The, the next one, is, T, is type. What type? So you're gonna work out frequency three days a week, your intensity, you're gonna push really hard, your time, 20 minutes. Doing what? What type of exercise? You're gonna jog, you're gonna walk, cardio equipment, swimming, cycling, interval training, high intensity interval training, Tabata fart like training. What are you gonna do? What type of training? E, fit, F-I-T-T-E, it's a silent E, for enjoyment. Fit, with the E, for enjoyment. What do you like to do? What do you like to do? You see all of these things and you're like, I really like cycling, but I heard running is the best thing for me. That's not true. As long as you're maintaining your intensities, find something you like to do. Work with your clients to find exercises that they enjoy or in some instances that they dislike the least. And let's build into that, a slow build a progressive build, just like the OPT model. It is a systematic progression, moving from what they can do, and then they have comfort doing, that they enjoy doing, and then progressing them. And then we can work on volume, volume. 
So what is what is the amount of uh, total volume that people are doing in their training and putting that volume together in a training program. So we need to hit maybe X amount of minutes if we're focusing on our time, but we're also focusing on our uh, intensity and how far we've gone maybe. So we'll take that, we'll forget that all into volume. And then we look at our progressions. Our progressions are taking them slowly through a progressive system and different types of training protocol. So we'll look at concepts of cardiorespiratory fitness training. First of all, there's a warm up. There's a general warm up, which a general warm up really may have nothing to do with the type of exercise that you're doing. It's just a, usually considered a cardiorespiratory exercise, not specific to the following or subsequent exercise, unlike a specific warm up, which is very specific to the subsequent training exercise that you're going to be doing. So if you're going to be lifting in a bench press, a specific warm up would be doing a light bench press and building up before you get into your training protocols. A general warm up, if you're going to be doing bench press, is the five minute warm up on the treadmill that has nothing to do with bench press. That's a general warm up. Specific warm ups follow suit a little bit more specifically. Increasing heart rate and cardiorespiratory and your respiratory rate, that's part of the warm-up. Tissue temperature increasing. The psychological preparation for bouts of exercise as you mentally are getting ready for going into your cardiorespiratory training. So that's a part of it as well. So that's our warm-up. And then you get into the conditioning. And the benefits include stronger and more efficient heart. It includes improved ability to pump blood. It includes reduced risk of heart disease. And it includes imp improved oxygen transport. Many other things that are included in your cardiorespiratory conditioning. And then you move into your cool down. And your cool down is just reducing your heart rate and breathing rates gradually as your body temperature starts to calm down. Return the muscles to their optimal resting lengths. Prevent blood pooling in the lower extremities and restore physiological systems to baseline. So slowly bringing it down, cooling it down, walking it off. All right, there are different types of stages, or different stages of training in our cardiorespiratory focus. Stage training, this is done to ensure progress in an organized fashion, to ensure continual adaptations and minimize the risk of injury and for overtraining. So there are four zones and five stages. The purpose of stage training, we want to ensure that cardiorespiratory training programs progress in an organized fashion to ensure continual adaptation, to minimize risk of overtraining. Five stages of cardio training are discussed in this chapter on cardio training, and they use different intensities or training zones. So let's look at these zones. We've got stage one. Stage one, start slowly and work up to 30 minutes of continuous activity. We don't expect any clients to jump right into 30 minutes of continuous cardio. So don't put that on your clients. Make sure that you are supporting them. If 15 minutes, if five minutes is all they can get, five minutes is all they can get. We have a goal that we'd like to get to the point where you, they can do that for 30 minutes. So start slowly, work up to 30 minutes of continuous activity. Stage one, the ability to maintain zone one for at least 30 minutes, three times per week and prepare them for stage two. The goal here is to build an aerobic base, to build aerobic base. The aerobic base is being built. I realize when I say build an aerobic base, it may sound like anaerobic and that is not what I'm trying to do. So to aerobically build your base and foundational levels of fitness. Zone one is light to moderate in its intensity. Stage training number two, stage two, intermediate levels of cardiorespiratory fitness. The interval or steady state working into zone two. So this can be doing a five to 10 minute warm up and then doing 30 minutes of an exercise at a challenging or a difficult workout and then cooling down for a five to 10 minutes, or it could be a five to 10 minute warm up, and then one minute, let's say, and this is just an example, one minute in zone two, pushing yourself, challenging and hard, and then going into zone one for a three minute active cardio where you're bringing your heart rate back down. 
one minute zone two, three minutes zone one, one minute zone two, and then cool down for three to five minutes. That's a nice kind of interval workout that you could do in stage two. And this is to ensure, again, continual adaptations and minimize the risk of overtraining and injury. Stage three, moderately advanced client. This is a vigorous or very hard workout. Stage three, vigorous or very hard, increases the capacity of aerobic and anaerobic energy systems. So we have intervals in zones two and three. So your goal in stage three is you're doing this training zone, training zone one, light to moderate, training zone two, challenging or hard, training zone three, vigorous or very hard. So you're going in between zone two and three in this stage. So one minute in zone two, and then progress to a harder zone two workout for a minute, and then a zone three for one minute, and then back to zone two for a minute, back to zone three for a minute. And you can go in and out of those intervals and then cool it down. That warm up and that cool down would take place in zone one, that light to moderate, easy breezy for the warm up, and then build the challenge in. All right, that's stage three. Stage four training is going to take you into zone four. Zone four is very hard. Zone four is your max effort. It, it's a hard advanced push for a short, brief period of time. This is for advanced clients. Increases the capacity of the anaerobic energy system, and it moves in and out of all four training systems. So you do your warm up in zone one, and then you can build into your zone two for maybe one minute and your next interval, one minute in zone three, and then your next interval, zone four, 10 seconds, all out effort, as much as you can push, and then whoosh, drop it down to zone one and recover. Do a recovery for three minutes in zone one, and then push yourself for 10 seconds in zone four. And then you can cool it down and even wrap up your training systems if that's what you wanna do. Just a brief training, stage four training, for your clients as an example of what you can do. Stage training. And then stage training number five. Number five stage training is sports specific training and it focuses on drills that help to improve conditioning. So that might be, you think of things like the agility ladder, the speed ladder that might be there, dot drills, shark skill tests, some other things. You got high intensity interval training or small side games or agility drills that you do for the specific purpose of helping to increase sports performance. So there, we've covered several topics today through our uh, chapter 15. So 13, 14, and 15 on CPT domain five. Thanks for joining this webinar. I hope you found it helpful and supportive and learned a little bit about the CPT-7 for those of you who have already gone through it. And for those of you who are studying for the exam, I hope that you find this to be a nice overview and help support you in your process of studying. If you got questions for me, feel free to reach out. Uh, Instagram, dr.rickrichey, R-I-C-H-E-Y, or you can email me at rick.richie at nasm.org. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for listening. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.